Yep, that's it. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Paul. Hello. Uh, good of your book show us the copy of your book well funnily enough and amazingly yes i do there it is <laughs> Out of like a parliamentary speech okay yeah. but i have to say do you know what my first impression was like let's sort of like it's like let's like say how to restore a classic car it seems so old-fashioned does anybody care about parliamentary speeches anymore you know it, well, isn't it sort of tell me a bit about it tell me about the book well it's a uh... A, a long time ago, I started working in the British Parliament, and I remember being thrown into this job in my early 20s, working for a quite a prominent shadow secretary of state, um, and being asked to do all these jobs within that role, uh, including writing speeches. And of course, I had no training or experience and nothing of any kind, really. You sort of learn on the job. And uh, looking back, I think, well, I wish there'd been a book that could have told me how to do it. And astonishingly, I'm not sure if you'll believe this, Brian, but there is there has been no book on how to write a parliamentary speech, as far as I could discover, ever written. Um, there are plenty of books about speech writing, of course, as this group will know more than anyone. And there are loads of books that are compendiums of parliamentary speeches, but there's not a sort of how-to guide, uh, certainly not in the modern age, you know, for 800 years. So um, that's one of the impetuses to write it. Um, and then to your question, does it matter? I think we, we we are speech writers, so we would always say, yes, it does. But I think it still does, uh, not least because speech is not in their entirety, but in their clips are amplified across social media and the broadcasters and do shape our politics and, and shape the debate and the discourse. So I think there is still a utility to doing it. And I mean, they have to say the book is, is aimed at staffers and MPs and others interested in the topic, um, also in the hope it might elevate the quality because one thing I think we've all noticed is that the quality can be pretty dire. Um, MPs thrown into the chamber at the last minute with very little uh, research or uh, preparation and just delivering really rather poor speeches. OK, um, well, I used to have, I don't know if you had this tape of parliamentary speeches. Before. Mm, I do. I had a CD, actually, but another one you made. Yeah, yeah. But because, um, of course, in it was only in 1980-something or other that they started televising. Um, so I think uh, it is that. That's, the one that's you're it, great parliamentary speeches. And as a, as, as a yeah. sort of student, um, I love listening to those. Yeah. And, 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 and I sometimes sort of think, how could we improve Parliament? Well, maybe we could take it off the TV. You know what I mean? <laughs> because yeah. listening, um, you know, like the radio obviously has a different um, impact and um, there was a kind of uh, how would I say the terrible solemnity and and and, and uh, reverence for these these kind of uh, broadcasts mm. uh, that used to be on the Radio 4 every week. do they still have um, the, the today in Parliament or they like yes they do and uh, I mean, that's another reason why decent speeches do matter because you if you do say something particularly pertinent or well crafted, then it will arrive on the BBC and, and a much audience, bigger audience will will hear it. Um, there's there was a as you'll remember, there was a huge debate about televising Parliament and uh in fact what there's a I re I refer to a that that moment in, in the book. Um so a an image consultant had written round to all the MPs ahead of broadcast advising them, or you know basically trying to get work, advising them on their hair, their suits and their um, their non-verbal communication and all this. So this, this caused enormous hilarity uh, at the time. But actually, of course, they do now think about those things. And in fact, they even think about where to sit or stand in the chamber, because as you know, the hanging microphones that hang from the ceiling, if you're standing in the wrong place, then the camera's they get the microphone, it obscures your face. It's hanging down in front of your face. So the savvy ones have worked out where to stand so they get an uninterrupted view of their face on the telly um, and for their own social media as well. So it, television has impacted. And you also might remember the, the phenomenon of donutting, where if the chamber was you know more than half empty and, and somebody was speaking, their mates would kind of donut around them to make it look like the chamber was packed for their big speech. But in fact, it was only four or five of your friends sitting in strategic positions around you. So yeah, television has, has changed actually the way the way they behave, uh, not necessarily for the better. And and in the old days, there were these great parliamentary performers who everybody, you know, Michael Foot, Enoch Powell, yeah, uh, uh, Callahan and Thatcher, and all these characters were 
were, were kind of huge um, figures who who there was a kind of quasi sermon type uh, delivery in, in in the House of Commons. Um, how did they construct their speeches? I mean, certainly you're right. There was a there was, you know if, if Churchill or F. E. Smith or any of these people back into the 20th century even were speaking. Um, a buzz would go around the tea room and, and people would come out from whatever they were doing and they would come and listen because it was, a, you know, a performance. It was a bit of art, really. I mean, Churchill famously dug very deep into the classics and he understood the rhythms and the tempo, the tempo and the um, the sound of classical rhetoric. And he would always try and, um, although his speeches were sometimes built around the idea of spontaneity and him sort of thinking on his feet and that, they weren't. I mean, they were practiced and rehearsed and uh, thought about in advance. Um, and he would, he, I mean, Churchill's a fascinating parliamentary figure because, of course, he's a lot of his speeches were designed to be heard beyond Parliament. So he was a great parliamentary orator. He would construct them in ways using very simple language, very short sentences. Um, as he always said, the old words are the best, you know, so going back into the Anglo-Saxon type words um, designed for radio. He knew that he would be broadcast on the radio, so uh, he um, he did think about the, the wider popular audience as well as his own colleagues. I mean, the best speeches in Parliament do have a degree of spontaneity, but the ones that are purely last minute. And I was talking to an MP last night about this, where they they were a bit short on speakers, and uh, the whip just went around and saying, "Right, get in there and talk about this," and they're sort of getting thrown into the front line without any preparation. I mean, they're usually pretty dire. They usually rely on the handout of lobbyists and campaigners. They usually sort of repeat points that others have already made from the same handouts. They come and they go and they have they leave no trace. So I think, you know, there is still a very strong role for the speechwriter and for the craft of it. People that actually can know how to put a speech together and can give that to an MP to deliver well, and that will elevate their speech into something a bit more special. But, but, um, but I think it was about 15 years ago. No, it must have been about 25 years ago. Um, I, I met Diane Abbott and she was mm. saying how basically the trade of politics is no longer taught. And, and I think this came out in the uh, election, the, 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 the election where you had about four graduates and you had Jeremy Corbyn. And, and mm. Jeremy Corbyn was the loony candidate who didn't have a hope. But mm. the problem with the graduates is that they couldn't they couldn't hold the room. They couldn't do do. Um, mm. Do, do 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 the um the business of going around to a town hall and and chipping up the troops. So, so so is this still a qualification for being an MP? Well, isn't it interesting? Because I think um you're you're right. That again in the book I talk about this sort of where I mean certainly the whole generations after generation of MPs learned their speech writing and speech making in the Oxford Union, in the Cambridge Union, you know, in that sort of elevated uh educational setting or in in the public schools where they would learn debating and so on but there's also a generation of, of non-public school mps often in the liberal benches and the labor benches who learned it in trade unions in, on, in you know car parks on street corners in works <laughs> canteens and in That's big true. tempestuous kind of yeah. meetings you know on, on soap boxes and so they learned it in the same way but in a very different setting and i think that a lot of that has gone now that now it's the rise of the technocrat isn't it people who are coming in who've been the political officer for a trade union never had to really speak to mass meetings or sway a crowd um and you can tell you know the, the quality i think has gone down i do i do warn against the idea that there was a golden age there because i think you know you mentioned a, a series of names there brian like uh, thatcher and uh, Foot and Tony Benn and others that people would crowd in to watch. I mean, for every one of those, there was a hundred who were pretty poor, and a lot of MPs didn't even turn up at all. They would just come up and vote after the theatre or after you know an evening in their club or whatever, and they'd just come up and vote at ten o'clock without speaking or listening to the debate at all. So I don't think there has been a previous golden age. I just think we always have to be a bit careful of that. Um, but yeah, at the moment they're they're learning on their feet, and you can tell from the maiden speeches who is coming through and, you know, has, has thought about it and who hasn't and is not necessarily going to do so well. But it's early days for them. I mean, most of the parliament, as you know, is new, so they're all finding their feet. Okay. So uh, when... Now, before you speak, Brian, will you release the beasts? We're all on blocked camera. Sorry for the interruption. How do I do that? Well, you've blocked us all. <laughs> Sorry. 
Sorry. Well, I can I can see people on my on my thumbnails. I can see Deborah and I can see James, Jim. Florian, Carola, Jim. How, how do Carla, I do that? How did, there we are. How did I do that? It was a, a Freudian move, Brian. I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that. Um, I don't believe it. You're, you're sick of my ugly mug. Okay. Use tools. Suspend fast. Participants. If you go to participants and you click the three little dots, it might give you the option. Uh, where are we? Participants. Can I just answer Lucy's question while you're... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Do that. So Lucy in the chat has asked which MPs employ speechwriters. And there's a there's an interesting facet of the UK system, which is that none of them do, in the sense that no one has a job title speechwriter in Westminster, unlike, you know, parliaments all over the world where that is a job with a career path and, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so it, it is usually one part of somebody's job, uh, but they're all doing other jobs too so researcher or maybe they're doing political casework or they're organizing visits and uh, dealing with constituents and all that sort of stuff so it, we have a sort of strange aversion i suppose in our system to say well of course there are speech writers and of course they're writing speeches for mps uh, and we kind of hide them and i was fed i was coaching somebody just uh, during the week uh, this week and um you know he's in exactly this position he's got a new member of parliament he's working for he um he's doing all these different jobs and one aspect of his job is speech writing um and he's got no training or experience at all so that's why we were talking but it's 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 a funny british thing where somehow we've kind of a, it's a, you know it's under the table it's almost like we're ashamed of the idea of it whereas you know obviously you go to america or somewhere it's a proper job but but um hang on here they've always had um acolytes to supply the um lines for prime minister's questions haven't they well, PM Kids is a very different kettle of fish, isn't it? And I, I mean, my chum, Aisha Hazarika, wrote a very good book in conjunction it's with another recording. author um, and uh, called Punch and Judy Politics. And uh, yeah, the kind of effort that goes into PMQs because it is the sort of set piece of the week, I think, is a different scale. And, and politicians will often employ external folks like us or even joke writers um, and others and i mean the prime minister and the leader of the opposition will do role play and they'll play you know they have their staff playing different roles um of, of uh, other mps and so on so yeah they take that terribly seriously but you know who is who is um officially the sort of prime minister's speech writer i think there is somebody in number 10 but it's not a sort of prominent public figure like it would be in the american system for example Oh, Paul, I think you might be upsetting some people here in our group. <laughs> you know, the, the, one of Starmer's speechwriters is a um, uh, former speechwriter to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Do you know that? Yeah. And, um, yeah. But they're, not, they're, but, they're not, but they're not public figures, you know, in the sense that the American presidential speech writing team would be is my point i'm not i'm not suggesting for a minute they haven't got one i'm just i'm just suggesting that they're not but, 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 but you know occasionally you, you know like um phil collins was, was, was definitely a kind of uh yeah, yeah. figure and um you know uh there have been david cameron had a few speech writers who who, who had a kind of public profile but I, I think it's not good to have a public profile and to be but, well but, i tend to agree I mean, people often ask me who do i write for I always refuse to say because I just think it should be the sacred bond of, um, you know, confidentiality between the writer and the I, speaker. I completely agree, Paul. I think it's madness that people are on LinkedIn of all persuasions and tell you what they're doing with who right now and taking photographs of it. It's, it's <laughs> lunatic. Yeah. Well, it sort of it shines light on the magic, doesn't it? And I just think uh, it's not not a great look, really. Yeah, uh, you know, I think. Uh, we like to have the illusion, perhaps, that politicians and political leaders are crafting their own stuff and saying it out loud. I think, you know, it should be it should be subterranean. I think. I mean, it's, it's a the point of a ghostwriter is they're a ghost, right? You can't see them. That's the whole point. Yeah. But but the other thing is is that how are we training um our speechwriters in the sense that um, you know, if you look at the House of Commons and you stand in the House of Commons, it's obviously an adversarial idea behind the room, isn't there? You know, mm. and 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 sort of. I suppose one of the disappointments about Prime Minister's Question Time in recent years is, is that there is no, um, you know, this 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 term of abuse, the Uniparty. You know, we, 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 sometimes we, we, it's hard to work out what what, what they disagree about. But but ultimately, mm. I think that uh, you know, you know, and this comes into the European Speechwriting Network. 
that, that, that it all comes out of rhetoric, you know, in Utramque Partem, there are two sides to every uh, question. And, and that's an, a profoundly epistemological principle that, that actually reality is paradoxical, that there is no truth, there is only two sides to, to everything. And, and and that's how you train a speechwriter. And one, do, do you mention any of this sort of uh, kind of the, obviously Latin and, and Greek used to be where all the prime, mm. prime ministers that's what they would have studied. And, and... I do, yeah, no, I do, I do reference to the fact that they they would often not only be classically trained, but they would also drop enormous Latin quotations into their speeches. I mean, Gladstone is famous for this, and uh, without the need for translation, you know, they just they would start quoting Virgil all over the place on the assumption that the house would know what they meant you know um your point about the gladiatorial nature of it is interesting i mean again colleagues may or may not know this but the british house of commons chamber uh belongs to the late 40s early 50s it was remodeled um well it was rebuilt because it was completely burned to the ground after a successful bombing raid in in the war um and this was largely hushed up the british population do not know this by and large i test this out on groups and they say i didn't know that they we assumed it was uh, victorian and in that post-war period uh, the, the the post-war leaders including churchill had a choice. They could have made it a big open seminar style, you know, with the horseshoe shape, and they could have had a electronic voting and a seat named for every member of parliament, 650 or whatever. Um, and they decided against all of that. They wanted to have something crammed and cramped, noisy uh, and, and gladiatorial, two sides facing off against each other without enough seats for all the MPs. So when they all turn up, it's noisy and boisterous and in the in the parliamentary debate on this, Churchill famously said, "We shape our buildings, and then they shape us." Um, and he wanted that style, so that lends itself to that style of speech making, which is, you know, argumentative and and as you say, it's a dialectic. You know, it's not about a collegiate open uh, sort of deliberation; it is about a clash of ideas. But but do you think the people that the MPs, you know, you know, sort of. In previous eras, the MPs um, have had this kind of statesman training of, of being writers and, and being mm. uh, sort of uh, having a hinterland. You know, often they'd, they'd done something before they came into power. Mm. The, 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 well, I, I, again, for every, you know, fantastic uh, legal mind or writer or novelist or you know there are lots of buffoons in the house of commons as well and i like to say i warn against the idea of a golden age because um a lot of them were absolute duffers and they couldn't speak for toffee you know and they would turn up and, and like i say maybe speak once a year or something and maybe sometimes not even at all so um we we sort of mark out the greats but that's because they were unusual usually okay so so, so... These new MPs who are showing up to the House of Commons, yeah. what, if they picked up your book, what, what kind of ideas, what, what are you telling them to do? Are you telling them to read more? Are you telling them to think dialectically? Are you thinking them, telling them to um, practice public speaking? You know, Do you advocate using these many public, uh, public speaking trainers? Because you know, one of my claims to fame is mm. that um, when uh, I was a friend of uh, Liz Truss in, in the uh, uh, early, uh, late 90s, and um, Liz said to me, oh, would you like, uh, ha how should I improve my public speaking? And I said, you need to go to Toastmasters. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and, and uh, to her credit, she did. She did the 10 um, module sort of speeches, and um, everybody says I should be ashamed and it shouldn't, but, but, you know, she became prime minister. You can't. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Obviously worked. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, well, the, the book, the first thing the book says is to understand the rules because uh, so many MPs I've spoken to, even, even in the last week, they get caught out by some of the parliamentary rules. They haven't quite mastered it yet. So for example, the guillotine often comes down from six to four minutes and a lot of them just don't know what to do because they've got six minutes of material and then suddenly only got four minutes. And I think the speaker this week was even saying, I'm going to bring this down to one minute unless you will start behaving yourself. So so um, they, they, they've, the first thing I say is understand how you can have, build in elasticity into your speech. So you're not just reading off a script, but there's things you can do and not do within it that don't take away from the meaning um, to allow for the, the guillotine, you know, things like that. Um, even the, the mechanics of how to, 
get a speech in a second reading debate, how to structure your maiden speech. I mean, maiden speeches have been very good for trade, I have to say, in this last few weeks. I've managed to pick up a few of those um, for folks and, um, you know, write some of them as well. And I think the, the main advice, and this, I'm, I'm sure you agree with this, is just to spend time in the chamber, learn the ropes, see other people doing it and learn from them and kind of get mastery of the house before you try and do anything much else. You know, just you know, master the chamber first and then you can do all the other things you want to do. But without that, it's very hard to do that. And I think the, what, the real danger in our parliament is that there are these sort of so-called superstars who have been elected and all eyes are on them now. and They're just waiting for them to fall. You know, the best thing I think is just to take your time and build it up slowly. Because the other um, guru of political speech writing is Max Atkinson. Have you heard mm. of Max Atkinson? Well, he gets a special mention in my book, actually. I, I refer to his his book and his experiment, famously, with when he, at the SDP conference where he took somebody off the street virtually and uh, trained them up. But I, I do pay credit to him because I think, I mean, his book has been a huge ins inspiration and a uh, fantastically useful set of advice. I think I've been using it for the last 30 years, as I'm sure everyone here has as well. Yeah, but 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 if you read his obituary, it sort of said that you know political or oratory is kind of dead, and 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 of course the party conferences was another kind of place where you'd see impressive speech making, and um, you know the the grassroots would be there, and um, uh, it would be a kind of sometimes a a very I want to say heated exchanges. I remember the. Dennis Healy and all those kind of people. Mm. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, they've taken all the energy out of the uh, uh, party conferences, haven't they? Because they don't like, you know, I think the essence of politics is massive rows and then mm. you can have harmony. But but the, the, the modern political culture is to not to cut out the massive rows. Stage management. <laughs> Well, I mean, this was my 34th annual Labour Party conference. And I think that, that is a, a fair... Uh, assessment that you've given there which is all all of the all the rows are now away from the cameras but on the other hand the fringe has got bigger and better and more excited so actually on the fringe i think you are still seeing great speeches and you know great sort of debates and contributions but they're away from the main hall um and so some of that politics has still been played out so it's like whack-a-mole isn't it if you try and push it down here it's going to come up somewhere else um and i think uh, it's still there but yeah uh although again i would say you think of some of the very great conference speeches over the years, they, they are, you know, punctuation marks in a long line of not very good speeches at all that delegates have to sit through day after day. And then occasionally a really good one pops up. So it's it, there hasn't been, again, a golden age of conferences either. Um, the ones we think of, the ones that get into compendiums and uh, on, on CDs and so on are the, are the rarity. Uh, but yeah, you know, I've, I've sat through three some absolutely brilliant ones that make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. You know, so I remember seeing Nelson Mandela and um, Blair was always good. Neil Kinnock, I saw him a few times. You know, there are people who are. Um, I was the warm up act in the 1990 Labour Party conference for Barbara Castle and she still had it even then. Um, she was a fantastic platform performer. So, yeah, there are these people who can wow a conference. And then on the Tory side, you know, people like Michael Hesitine, I wish I'd seen him speak in his in his pomp because i reckon that would have been an amazing experience okay but but um i think now there is a kind of fear but also of pol political oratory i've never you know as a consumer of um political speeches i think um george galloway is fantastic you know and i like jeremy corbyn and i like nigel farage to a certain extent in their ability mm. to say things which uh get people who are not in political circles um interested and, and, and engaged yeah but but um the the, the political class, class tends to absolutely loathe these people what yes. <laughs> well this is, i mean this uh, the the kemi badenoch phenomenon that we're sort of experiencing at the moment is another example of that isn't it i think um it's a bit you know our argument is it not that we, is, is that speeches matter they make the weather they shape our discourse you know they are an important uh tool in the political armory um, and yet, you know, James Cleverley, the Conservative contender, gave by far the best speech and, and all the plaudits were in his direction and he was the front runner. And yet now he's been knocked out of the race because unfortunately it would seem the ability to deliver a speech is not the only criteria that they're thinking about. They are also thinking about other things too. And it would seem that 
certain amount of gaming has taken place to sort of knock him off the the final two. So uh, they were all hoping, I think, that it would be like David Cameron in 2010, where his speech actually just, you know, blew everyone else's socks off. And uh, he, he came through as the winner of both the hustings and then the leadership contest and then the election. Um, they were hoping to emulate that, but that didn't happen, did it? I reread uh, Cameron's speech, by the way, um, just ahead of the Tory debates this week in the UK. And, the, I mean, it is a really good speech, you have to say. It's a nicely crafted sort of the political through line around, you know, the need to change to win. Um, it's very strong and he delivered it well, supposedly, as we know, without notes. But that was obviously a nonsense. He obviously memorised big chunks and had his notes somewhere just in case. But but it was done very fluently. And, and David Davis, by contrast, his uh, opponent just kind of try to appeal to the crowd and it uh, didn't work. So speeches do matter, but uh, so does voting, it turns out, as the Conservative Party have found this week. Um, now, one of the things I've noticed this week um, is that uh, the European Parliament is suddenly um, coming alive because um, there's a kind of a breakdown, I think, in, in terms of, um, you know, Viktor Orban is obviously the Hungarian... Um, presidency of the eu and and of course he's a satanic figure in 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 many uh european chanceries or whatever it is and 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 you're getting the one side that the mainstream absolutely attacking him and he's fighting back now have you is there any advice in the book about uh, european parliament speeches <laughs> uh no i mean it's specific it's not even um scottish or welsh or northern irish assemblies i mean it is purely uh, westminster and mostly the Commons and a bit of the Lords. However, of course, there are tips and tricks for speechwriters across all legislatures, uh, and I am hoping that some of those will, you know, people will just pick it up as a as a benchmark uh, as well for what they do. I mean, Auburn's interesting, um, and you mentioned Farage. I mean, we could throw in Trump. You know, you know, the sort of the, the populists use elements of rhetoric very, very effectively. And people say to me, you know, talk about an effective use of rhetoric in politics. And you, I always go to the Trump speeches not because of the speeches themselves being particularly well crafted and uh, logical and ordered and structured because they're obviously not they are often rambling and you know disconnected but because of the use of rhetorical devices within them which he knows that that 15 seconds is going to get clipped and it's going to be amplified and multiplied millions and millions of times and if you think of uh, build the wall or lock her up or drain the swamp you know these are near perfect political slogans three syllables visual lots of imperative they speak to an emotional appeal uh they're repeatable memorable um, they're short you know all of the things that you would want to see in a, in a slogan or in a piece of a speech they, they obey those rules and then i always challenge audiences to say right well what were hillary clinton's equivalents of that in that same election that trump won and usually the answer comes there, none, you know, all of that campaigning, but we can't think what she was saying. So rhetoric still matters, still counts. And I think the populists know that and they are very good at using it, um, albeit through social media, but um, still reaching millions of people. Hmm. OK. And do, do you think that, um, you know, you mentioned you didn't feature the the, the, the Scottish or the Welsh parliaments. Um, I've, I've been around them. Um, and I think the technology gets in the way, sort of thing, you know, the desks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do, do you agree or what's your perspective? I, I do tend to. I mean, I was saying about Churchill and he wanting you know, sort of the clash of ideas. I think uh, um, I think it's harder to deliver a compelling speech in that setting where it is big, open, cavernous, horseshoe shaped with a you know microphone on a stick and everyone's in their seat and all that. Um, it, I think it, I mean, I've been lucky enough to be a special advisor in the UK and uh, sit in the officials box, which is next to the speaker's chair at the same level as the MPs. And you can hear the noise in the chamber that you don't hear on the microphones, on the telly and the radio and the kind of sense of drama. Also, also, you know, sledging and the bad behavior and all that as well, but you can feel the drama in the air. And I think it, that, a good a good parliamentarian can then elevate what they're doing to that occasion and, and sort of feed off the energy, which I think is very difficult to do in a big open parliament type setting like the European Parliament or elsewhere. Okay, um, is there anything else? I, I, I'm going to open it up to the 
Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get these, the, the, these cameras back on in a second, but uh, if everybody can try. But 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 anything else you need to mention about the book? I haven't actually managed to get hold of a copy yet. But but but. Uh... Well, I think I mean, I, funny enough, two minutes before coming on this call, my doorbell went, and uh, fifty copies have just arrived. So it's obviously published. It exists in real form. I'm hoping that means it's going to be available online and in shops soon. So I think it will be available. I mean, the one I pre-ordered hasn't arrived yet. So anyway, it's it's filtering through slowly as the distribution comes through. Um, so yes, please do order it and uh, see colleagues order it as well. I think, you know, I think a speechwriter will, there'll be lots in there that you already know, of course, but there'll be insights, I think, about particularly about the, the Westminster Parliament that you might find interesting as well. Um, and as ever, it's just a good benchmark against what we do ourselves. Well, one of the inquiries I get through the network is that um, young people say to me, well, how do I become a speechwriter? Um, yeah. Um, so maybe you can answer that. And the other thing is, I suppose I, I, I always say that, you know, you get lots of graduates who want to work in politics. But I always say to them, well, you know, why and what for and what skills can you bring to it? Yeah. So I say, well, learn a bit about speech writing and then write to the person. Say you've done, you know, you're a member of the UK Speech Writers Guild or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And say to them, I can help you with your speech writing work. And then that would really stand out as, on a letter. Totally. It? I mean, MPs get written to a lot and it's usually sort of supplicant, sort of, please, can you help me? I'd love to work in Parliament. But if you go in with an offer, if you say, I can do something for you, I can do this or that on social media or I can make videos or I can write speeches, then they're gonna there's gonna be absolutely open door. You know, they, they you're complementing skills they don't have usually. So that's definitely true. And the the way to become a speechwriter, certainly in the UK, is to become a speechwriter. You know, in other words, just start doing it. There is there are no formal qualifications and there are excellent training courses, of course. Um, and the rest of it but there, there's no sort of formal route in the way to do it is just to set yourself up and start doing it and if you're really good at it you get work won't you um so it's not like the law where you have to study a great length to become a lawyer or a doctor or anything else it's something that you throw yourself into and develop and learn on the job and stretch your legs a bit and start doing different things and and build up a portfolio and read voraciously but also listen to speeches you know, through the lens of how it's been put together and how it's delivered um, we're lucky these days, aren't we, that you know all great speeches are on YouTube, so you can delve into the archives and see speeches going back certainly decades and uh, learn from that too. And it's a you know we're all learning every day, right? So we're all evolving our our craft as we go. Um, I think that's the best approach, really. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Now, can everybody try and turn their cameras on to see if I've are they still listening? <laughs> Well, there's certainly people still on the call. I can see, I can see, I can see Deborah. I can see Lucy. I can't see James, although I know he's there. I know it's strange that. Hang, hang on, let's see if um... Carla, Carolina, yeah, and Jim. I mean, there are people on the call, but the the um, Florian's here too. But the cameras are not on for whatever reason. I, I don't know, Florian. And you're, and, you're, and you're asking absolutely the wrong person. I've no idea. <laughs> do. Also, they're on mute as well. Hi. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well, has anybody got any questions? I haven't muted them all, have I? Maybe I have. Oh, God. I think, I think you might have done. Yeah, everyone's on mute. <laughs> How do I unmute them? It make, makes the conversation harder. I can't help but feel. There are... Um... <laughs> <laughs> so, hello. Who's still there? Yes, they're all muted. Everyone's muted. I Can you unmute oh, I'm not from muted. Hooray! <laughs> right. In, where it says Unmuted. participants in the chat thing... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you can click on unmute me, I think. I've unmuted everybody. Hey. Yes. Excellent. I don't know what happened there. You could all hear me, but are you... Yes. I, I still don't know how to fix these cam this camera issue. But anyway. Well, let's I have a chat I'm anyway. Unmuted, okay. So, any questions? Any questions for Paul? Yes, Paul. If you were writing a speech for somebody who was opposing the proposed assisted dying legislation, what points do you think you'd cover? Somebody who was opposing the assisted dying legislation? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, the classic formula in speeches, as you know, is the combination of ethos, pathos, and logos. And I think with that debate, it's going to be very long on the pathos, on the emotional appeals, and emotional arguments are going to fly back and forth. But I think the what Parliament needs to hear in this debate is some of the logos, is some of the evidence. Uh, 
on both sides of the argument to make its mind up. I mean, most MPs I talk to have not actually made their minds up. They do want a genuine debate and they want to hear the case put from both sides or all sides. Um, and I think the appeal to how it works in other countries and other, other jurisdictions, what the evidence is um, from places where similar laws are enacted, you know, for good or ill, um, as well as case studies, I think that is going to really help MPs arrive at the decision. And because it's not being whipped, um, it will be an individual vote and it will be a conscious vote. So they are going to be very tuned into the arguments, I think. So I would I would come up with some, you know, evidence, evidence based policy making we used to talk about. Um, but I think this will be an example of that, because um, and I think and if I was coaching an individual MP, I would say, well, come up with evidence that no one else has got. You know, are there particular studies that no one has necessarily talked about? Because on both sides of the debate, there'll be lots of briefing notes flying around. But I always think the speech that stands out is where somebody's done some research or digging beyond the obvious handouts um, and actually provide something new to the House to, to be far, far more compelling, I would suggest. One of the things I did was to look at um, Lord, whatever his name is, Bill, what is his name? Falconer. And yeah, in, Charlie Falconer, yeah. Yeah, in the Declaration of Intent in his bill, um, if you read it, um, it's not written in plain English. And I would very much hesitate to put it in front of a person with learning disability, learning difficulties, who mm. is being asked to sign the document to say, I'd like you to kill me. And mm. I thought this is indicative on um, a day, well, mental health day, when um, I mean, people with learning difficulties often have quite significant mental health problems as well. I know from volunteering in mind, um, people with learning difficulties who have mental health problems, um, to be putting a document like that to say, I'd like to die in front of a person like that, in the way it's written was absolutely appalling. And it really brings to mind the disability rights slogan, nothing about us without us. There's been no public consultation with the disability charities in any proper format, no green paper, which was what we used to have in the good old days. Mm. And I just think it's quite shocking piece of legislation to give parliamentary time to. And it's now got a date of, I think, Friday the 29th of November. So. Um, Kim Leadbeater's bill is different from Charlie's, I believe. I've not been following it that closely, but it is a different piece of legislation. But, I mean, the, it, you know, if the argument is this needs to be put into public consultation or if it needs to be put into plain English, then those are the arguments that need to be made in the debate and uh, will then go into committee as amendments, you know, so it can, it can be put forward. And that those two points would be excellent points for an MP to stand up and make, I would say. So... Um, this is the point of a second reading debate, isn't it? Is that you can ventilate some of these issues where people haven't really thought it through or you think there's a gap in the argument or anything else. Do, do you think um, politics, if, if you make a speech in the House of Commons, do the whips listen? Do the party managers listen to the... Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a whip on the front bench taking a note of everybody that's speaking. And if somebody speaks well or badly or is offside or onside, then it's all noted. So there, there is a certainly an internal process. L Lucy has her hand up, I believe. Uh, I've got a question about how do you influence policy? So whether yeah. that's from a, a politician's point of view or influencing a politician. Um, I'm a scientist by background, engineer. Um, and so, yeah, logic to me is the way forward. But I know that logic to most people isn't yeah. the way forward. Yeah. So how would I go about persuading someone about policy? Um, I get asked that question quite a lot, actually. And I think it was C.P. Snow, who was the sort of great post-war public intellectual, said that they're both, it was, well, I forget his exact phrase, but it wasn't two great camps, but it was two, two clashing civilizations yeah. or something like that, where the science and the arts basically clashing and, and politics is the arts. And they have trouble with the sciences. Um, as you will know, most parliamentarians are not Scientist, science graduates, you know, or background in science. Some do, but most don't. Um, and then most of them are not particularly scientifically or numerally literate. Um, so the the thing I'm often asked to do is, 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 is translation, basically. Um, translation of quite complex scientific, technical, engineering, whatever it might be, terms into everyday terms for a, a wider audience. 
and the, and one of the best ways to achieve that is through story storytelling isn't it it's through turning it into anecdotes and explaining it through quite a narrow cast anecdote to illustrate the bigger point which is a good rhetorical device in itself but i think for this audience in particular it makes sense you know some mps are absolutely i mean i've worked with ministers some of them absolutely love tables of numbers and they love delving into spreadsheets but most of them don't you know they really are quite impressionistic and they'll take their information in different ways so i think it's that translation job really so sort of bridge the gap between these two two um competing kind of worlds i would say Thank you. Oh, where are you, Lucy? You look like you're on a narrow boat or something. I am on a narrow boat. Of yes. course, though, I can tell. <laughs> how lovely. Whereabouts are you? I'm in Nottingham. Oh, that's super. I yes. bet it's rather nice, isn't it? It is. I'm in a marina, so I don't have to keep moving, which is even nicer. <laughs> that's good. Excellent. Who's next? Yeah. Carol. Yeah. I'm just following on on what Lucy said. Um, I wanted you. I wanted to go narrower and ask you: How do you think of metaphors? I get very excited when I come up with a good one, and I'm not sure how I how I go about it. Um, and I just wanted to know how other speechwriters um, go about taking something very complex and then coming up with something really cool uh, in terms yeah. of metaphor that <laughs> others can understand. I haven't found my own recipe, so. I what think it's a bit instinctive, isn't it, Carol? I mean, I think it is, it, isn't it? It is something, there's not a formula, but I do think metaphors, of course, work extremely well in this context. I mean, I always take a George Orwell's advice, which is to not use anything that you're used to seeing in print. So the avoidance of the cliche. Um, in the UK, we're talking a lot about red walls and blue walls and sea walls and grey walls. And these walls have become, you know, a cliche now as to what they actually mean. But Which well is interesting that you say that, actually, because mm. what is a cliche... I mean, I work with a non, non-English native speaker mm. speaking to an audience of non-English native speakers. And he actually will prefer a cliche. A, he won't perhaps recognize it um, as a cliche because it hasn't been overused in his languages and his culture. Mm. Um, and so he'll think it quite clever. Or maybe he's heard it before, but not as often as we have heard it before. Right. <laughs> and so I'll come up with something really wonderful that is not a cliche and an old cliche that is actually quite good, but we've all heard it a bit too often. Like, you know, if you grew up on the East Coast of the US, you heard at a certain point Billy Joel too often. His songs are pretty all right, but, you know, after a while they're not. And so it's funny, I actually battle with that. Um, at, yeah. at the moment, I'm battling uh, against the word concrete, which to me has very negative connotations, bad for the climate, gray, um, yeah. brittle, but everything here is concrete. We have concrete answers. We've got concrete yeah. answers. We've That's got concrete principles. I'm like, can we stop with the concrete? And I think it's, um, sorry, I, I think it has to do with... Uh, with how often us us English native speakers have heard something versus yeah that's very true and um, I think the other trick to metaphor is of course that it has to be something we can all understand you know so yes. if, uh, I in my training I say well you know a metaphor that says she was a hadron collider of a woman is absolutely meaningless we'll understand that. I, don't, I don't know what the properties of that are. I mean, Lucy probably does because she's a scientist. But, you know, I I don't know what that is, and it just you know if you say he was a bear of a man. I can get that big hairy man, but Hadron Collider, no, not so much. So it does need to be culturally acceptable, understood. Um, that's why I think the best metaphors are very simple terms, aren't they? So Martin Luther King talks about a table of brotherhood or some such. It's something we can all kind of get behind Obama with his rocky road or um, Norman Tebbit saying. Can I add a little uh, on this? Yeah, um, please. I work with a lot of neurodiverse people yeah. and similes are fine. Metaphors are just too... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I don't. You, well, a, a leap of imagination. Well, that's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I assume also if we're working with people whose English isn't the first language. Yeah. So like, yeah, is that a? What does that mean? Exactly. Well, it's about so, so, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you know, as all with, all writing is down to understanding your audience, isn't it? So it's all about starting with them and working back. And I, I fear that. Uh, where we do write something with, with which we are particularly pleased, often they, those are the darlings that get murdered, aren't they? I mean, mm. unfortunately, it has to go on the cutting room floor or, or recycled for the next time, maybe. Um, Jim's got a hand up. Sure. Hello. Greetings from New York. Um, oh, yeah. I love not... the typewriter. That's a, what yes. is that? Is that an Olivetti or oh, something? Well, uh, no, I wish it were. It's a photograph of me from 1979 that my father took. 
Oh, bless. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so good well, memory. You, you, but... I mean, you like me, you probably learned on a typewriter. Oh, did you? I, I, not only did I learn on a typewriter, I still don't know how to type properly. I, it's a hunt and peck. So <laughs> that's how that's how I do it. But yeah, barring <laughs> barring the correction of the video problem, you're going to have to look at this nice black and white shot. But anyway, yeah. Uh, my my uh, two things. One, uh, coming from New York, I totally agree with you on Billy Joel. He's from Long Island, if you want to be granular. <laughs> uh, and it's a very different part of New York. So that's fine. The thing, I, I think it's a practical tip to, to the question of, you know, how do you create a metaphor? How do you create a meme worthy quote, et cetera? I, I'll put this in the chat. There's a uh, website that I was uh, religiously um, called Rhymezone. Rhymezone.com. It has, okay. um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. It has rhymes, near rhymes, uh, synonyms, antonyms, etc. It's really, really quite. Good. So if I'm looking for something that's, uh, you know, what's what's the quotable quote out of the speech? Yeah. I tend to look for something that's got alliteration that tends to use hard consonants as opposed to soft vowels, etc. Um, and the two again, just for the group, my my recommendation is check out Rhyme Zone. Okay, it's that's a really good. For almost every single speech. So, Brilliant. That's, it. that's oh. really helpful. Yeah, exactly that. There's lots of good resources. That looks like I don't know that one, but I'll look at it. That sounds yeah, good. You take a look. Thanks. And congrats on the book, but Thank you very much. Do, do, do try and my you could increase my American sales by one. I suspect <laughs> if you were to if you were to buy. It. Um, I mean, the point out about alliteration is well made, though, isn't it? Because, of course, if you are translating into other languages, then you lose the alliteration almost certainly because the words are different. So it's a, it is, a, as ever, you know, crafting it and tailoring it to the event and the yeah. occasion and the audience and the language. And to, um, I think it's Lucy's point. point, a lot of the, I teach at Columbia University, the vast majority of students actually are not native speakers. Yeah, they come from all over the world, and it is a it is a huge challenge to try to uh, get them to write English that's understandable so to an American or British audience. But then they say, "Well, what happens when I go back home?" And mm. I tell them, "I really can't help you. You're going to have to learn the tricks of the trade here, but then you're going to have to put it in context that makes sense yeah, yeah. for your home." So I mean, it's, we're, it's we're... an art. It is an art. We're lucky, though, are we not? That, I mean, most of the rhetorical devices we use were actually developed in ancient Greece and Rome and Latin and Greek. So they're not they're, they're not Anglo-centric at all, and they do apply across all languages. So you can take them and use them for your own purposes in any yeah. language. In, I remember being in Tanzania listening to the, um, the Speaker of the Tanzanian Parliament deliver a speech in Swahili, and I don't speak much Swahili, but I could certainly hear rhetorical devices that I recognised even in another language, because, you know, you could, you could hear the alliteration, you could hear groups of three, you could hear mm -hmm. rhetorical questions, you know, you could sort of hear it, uh, even though you couldn't understand it. So they are applicable across every language, thank heavens. They belong to us all, as I keep telling people. Um, and, you know, you take a Martin Luther King, he's adopting rhetorical devices to his own sure. purpose in the same way we need to next time you're speaking to 20 people in a, a room in Columbia University or whatever it might be. Uh, two points on it. One, in my class... Last one is on theory. I talk about ethos, logos, pathos. Now I also use kairos. Kairos, yeah, context, exactly. yeah, context for for the speech. And the second thing, and this is sort of an indictment of our profession, I suppose. I found out um, through one of my guest speakers that I have a dream was actually not written to the text of the speech itself. No. And you, you know the story. It was Mahalia Jackson telling him Martin, tell them about the dream. Yes, so, tell us. well, because the speech was flagging at that point. Yeah, it was only when she shouted out and gave him a bit of kick in the pants. As if I'm, I'm going to pull another. Book not, off my head. not only that, what's interesting about the the background the the background before that is part of the reason he yeah. didn't want to write give that speech. He'd actually decided not actively not to give the I have a dream speech yeah. because he was so sick and tired of it because yeah, he yeah. done it so often in churches and Mahalia Jackson was actually the only woman there but one of the only ones who had heard him give it a lot and as you say it was he was totally flagging but 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 I 
he had several people he worked on with speeches. I don't know if he had a true speech writer, but they had suggested that he he use it and he had actually said no. So it had been kind of quasi prepared beforehand because it's incredible right. yeah, when yeah. you watch it. Oh yeah, you can't make that stuff up to anyone on the spot, you know. Very good book on the Gary Young, who's a British Guardian journalist or was, wrote this book about the story behind the speech. And I recommend that. I mean I think it's a British book. I don't think it's a I don't know. But anyway it's um it tells exactly that story of how the yeah, uh, and FYI, the person who actually wrote the speech is 92 years old and adjunct professor at UCLA. Is so, that right? Uh, we're still trying to get him to come to the East Coast. Well, that's a wow, story. that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The point, the point just finally, just as a codicil to that, though, is that you know, if British parliamentarians try and sound like Martin Luther King, they they come a cropper. I would say you're not trying to sound like somebody else. You know, you can learn from someone these great speeches, but you're not copying them. Um, you've got to adapt to your own circumstances and your own needs and be yourself. You know, authenticity is the is the quality we crave most of all. So, you know, he was being true to himself, but you've got to be true to yourself. And the speech has to sound like you, not anyone else. Um, there we are. As I'm sure we all know. Paul, is there a danger that these MPs will start using AI to write their speeches? Do you know what? This is a really, really important question. So I got Tom Watson, who's a British um, politi politician and a member of the House of Lords, to write the foreword. Um, and uh, he, I kind of suggested to him that actually, Joey, you know, in the book, I don't think I mentioned AI at all. So I said, in the forward, can you address this question of AI? Uh, and I think there's, at the moment, um, you can tell when something has been written by ChatGBT or whatever, and it doesn't quite sound right. And you can certainly read stuff online now that you know. Academics can spot it in essays. But it won't be that long, will it, before it's almost indistinguishable? Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm half and half. Are we, is that going to put us all out of a job? Um, or will good speeches be written by humans? Because, and that's how you will tell they've been written by humans, because they're so much better, because they are empathetic, because they do have the true voice of the speaker, because they are up to date with the latest, what's going on in the news that morning, you know, and all of that stuff that makes a really good contemporary speech. Um, and, and the people that are just churning it out from... Uh, a chatbot, whatever, um, will be you know determined to have not been done a very good job. So I hope that's true. I hope that there is still a role for speech writers and writers generally, to be honest. But but here, here's what I how I take AI. Um, somebody said to me, "What's AI useful for?" Um, you know, you have to do risk assessments whenever you um, uh, you know, organize an event or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, well, he said, go to chat GPT, say, I want a risk assessment, things like that. Now, presumably you tell people to do a risk assessment because it forces them to think about the possibilities that uh, could arise sh should, you know, you're organizing an event. So you have to think. So it makes you think. Yeah. If you just go to chat GPT and just something off, you're not going to think about it at all. You're yeah, just yeah. Fill the, the thing. And, and I think that... Um, the creation of language, the creation of ideas is a craft in the sense that it's repetition, it's kind of thinking, it's changing and things. You can't just get a get a ready made product. I mean, Correct. human beings are, are, are reiterative creatures and it's... Well, indeed. <laughs> and also, I mean, going back to that point about the assisted dying bill, right? So the, the debate that will come through in that in that second reading um, it's going to have to be iterative. It has, going to, it has going to be MPs listening to each other and picking up points. And a good parliamentary speech is not something you walk into the room with and deliver. It is something that picks up from what others have said, responds to particular points, is adaptive and flexing along the way. I mean, there's the key things you want to say, but then you, you know, adapt it as well. So, And, you know, AI can't do that in the room. In the room has to be human actually listening and, and taking on the arguments as they see it. So... Uh, again, let's hope that humans still can triumph over the machines in that particular regard. Um, although, you know, my son is 21. He works in Parliament and he uses it um, for some basic research. So, you know, he's just just a shortcut just to get some facts and figures. Then he will use that in the way that he sees. But, you know, he is a digital native in the way that I'm not. And he's he has no trouble with AI at all. Geek. All right. But it's wonderful to see everybody. Uh, 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 <laughs> oh, look, there we are. What did you do, Lucy? Waved a magic wand. Who's <laughs> the engineer? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, look, 
Florian, tell us a bit about um, uh, speech writing in the German parliament. Do, 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 are there great speech? There are some pretty good speeches made in the German parliament, aren't there? I think that it's a great sort of layout, don't you? Yes, there were. I think uh, the the best, if I if I should say, the golden golden age of speaking uh, of speaking in parliament was in the nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties, when. When there was uh, Helmut Schmidt and uh, Rainer Barth, uh, those were the great speakers, or, or Franz Josef Strauss, who was, who was from Bavaria, they had really good speeches. Um, now, if you if you look at our um, our Chancellor um, Scholz, um, I wouldn't agree. I I think he's uh, he's some how should I say it, a bore. I think it's. it's <laughs> Strangely enough, because he's uh, he's a uh, a lawyer, and I I don't can't imagine how he ever won a lawsuit with speaking this way as he does. But he he isn't um, he isn't a good speaker anyway. And Angela Merkel as well. I, I think you you know um, Jörg Hackerschmidt. He was writer for Angela Merkel, and he was always disappointed because he said Angela Merkel was was very good at speaking. On the point, uh, freely, but but if, he, if she had in front of her, she had a um, a manuscript that that that, that didn't work, mm. and that uh, that's what what may interest me, um, Paul. Uh, uh, as you said, speaking is on the point in the room, uh, reacting to other uh, to other people. And I, th I think uh, good speeches are uh, are born, as you said, in, in this moment when you when when there is interaction, isn't it? Mm. I think that's true, but I think there's also a bit like that. I have a dream. Although he was spontaneous, it was all words that have been crafted in advance mm. um, and practiced out loud. And you know, I think by August that year, he had spoken, you know, three hundred times or something. And I think you know, in in parliaments similarly, even though they they are reactive and they are spontaneous, and it sounds like an ad lib, but it's, it, they are words that have been crafted in advance mm. for to work because nobody can think of this stuff on their feet and be brilliant. Um, you know, it does. It does need a bit of work behind it. But then, you, knowing how to use it and how to deploy it is the the craft, isn't it? Mm. Uh, I think there is. Yeah, I think. Well, there's sort of there's a rise of technocratic style politicians who are not particularly great um, public speakers, and you can contrast that with the populists who are more uh, sort of rhetorically well versed. And that's so maybe that's the sort of the, the fault line now in European mm. in parliaments. I don't know, but see, our, our Prime Minister Starmer is. Um, he's not a particularly great speaker, you know. He's he, he's a lawyer. He's sort of quite lawyerly as a result. Um, he's not a great performance, but you know he he's sort of part of a slightly different tradition, which is more technocratic and more bureaucratic, I suppose. And we have had, I mean, in the UK, as you'll know, we've had speakers, um, uh, leaders, and prime ministers who've not been very good at public speaking. Clement Attlee was not a very good public speaker, but he was a very good prime minister. So you know, it's not always the 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 two don't always go together. Okay. Um, yeah, Florian, I, I've just thought of the um, Fleiss essay Über die Allmähliche Verfertigung der Gedanken beim Reden. Do you remember that one? <laughs> yes, but that, that's 19th century, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was a, an essay. Early 19th century, yes. Ge German author called Kleist, who wrote this essay about how actually ideas come to us as we speak, which is yes. an interesting. I think there's definitely a truth in that, 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 that when you're speaking, bits pop out that you didn't actually, oh, where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> Can I just add on Germany? I, I worked for Siemens and I got the chance to see Gerhard Schlüter speak at the Lienplatz during the election. It was amazing. Really. I, I would add his name to this. Very cool. Um, James, it's good to see you as well. Least yeah, yeah. you've unleashed. <laughs> Sorry, I was taken away on a call, uh, but I did enjoy very much listening to you, Paul, and I wish you great success with your book. Thank you very much. Okay, well, well, like, well thank like you. Paul. Where, where do you recommend we get it from? From from Bite Back directly, or Amazon, or where? Where? I mean, whatever your conscience takes, really. So, uh, ideally, your independent local bookstore. But failing that, some online platform or other would be absolutely fine. I think it is now on. Um, Bitebacks, uh, the buyback of the publishers, their their website, and also the evil Amazon, if that's your thing as well. So, <laughs> whichever way. And Christmas is coming up, so you know, great, great, great stocking filler. <laughs> okay. 
All right. Well, um, thank thanks, you very guys. Much I enjoyed that. Really good conversation. And uh, we'll to come over to Ireland now, Paul, and tell us. I would love to. Yeah, I'm open to invitations, chaps. Germany, New York, New York is waiting. Ireland, <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. I'll be on the plane. Okay. All right. Thank you much, everybody. Hope to see you next week. Thank, Thank you. Brian. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bro. I'm just working out if I can give the host back. Apparently not. Oh, well. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.